Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. Today's message, I believe, is going to bless you. It's going to uplift you. And we're talking about the ten virgins. Now, this is an old one, but it's a good one. Amen. And uh, the, ten, the story of the ten virgins is going to get you ready to receive your blessings. And also, it talks about the return of Christ. So, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for blessing us this morning, Lord God. We thank you for waking us up this morning, Lord God. And get us prepared to receive your blessings and your word, Lord God. Open up our ears, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our souls, Lord God, to receive your blessings and, and to be ready when you return. We thank you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. I want you to go to Matthew 25, and I'm excited for the word. I am excited. Matthew 25, the ten virgins, that's what we're talking about today. If you've never heard this, I'm glad I will explain it to you, amen. If you have, if you've ever heard a preaching like this, maybe they taught it a little different, but you will learn, amen. And, and I know a lot of people are probably like, what are ten virgins have to do with me? has to do a lot with you. Amen. Matthew 25, verse 1. It says this. It says this. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten vir virgins. And this is Jesus talking right now, right here. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like Ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took their oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry ranged out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet, and the, the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. You have to understand a little bit about the customs back in those days. The ten virgins are... Well, let me tell you a little bit about the customs. Back in those days, you would get married, and when you would get married, they wouldn't go... They would have a celebration for a week long. So your wedding was just kind of like a week long. It wasn't just a couple hours and then you went on vacation. No, it was a whole celebration for like a week long. Now at this particular moment, God, Jesus himself, is saying something. To you guys so let me explain it to you guys tell your neighbor get ready so let me tell you this who is the bridegroom Jesus is the bridegroom he's the one coming Jesus is our bridegroom I know man, listen, I know we're man, but he is still our savior. 
Understand that. He is the bridegroom of what? The bride. Who is the bride? The church is the bride. We as a whole are the bride. And see, and then in this story, the church represents a virtuous, pure virgin who has not been defiled. The church represents a virgin who has not been with anybody else, but is just looking forward to the bridegroom. Does that make sense? And you might ask, how can we be that? We are born again. When we accept Jesus Christ, we are born again. All our sins are passed away. They are washed away. When you, when you come and you get baptized, that symbolizes your sins and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So your past sins, your past, you can say, well, I've been with this guy, this, whatever, right? It doesn't matter because now you are brand new. Understand, when God makes you brand new, you are brand new. I don't care how young, how old you are. Right? God wants that to be a blessing. He created us for one woman, one man. That when we come together and join in holy matrimony, it is something special. It is the first time. Does that make sense? So this will be something special between you and God. Who are the ten virgins? The ten virgins Five were wise, five were foolish. Are us, the church members, ourselves. Now understand this because I've actually been telling you guys for such a long time and, and, and I always make this illustration, there's a, there's a ton of churches, okay? There's a ton of churches that a lot of them are just playing church. So there's, Jesus right here is introducing you to two types of Christians. Two different types of Christians. One are wise, one are foolish. Five and five. Fifty percent of you guys are wise, fifty percent of you guys are foolish. And those that are pointing towards the others thinking they're probably the full ones, you yourself are probably the full one. <laughs> if you were pointing at others, it's probably you. I was going to say that already, but you, you didn't wait. See, because we always want to say, oh, that person's probably needs work. But no, no, in reality, we should be looking at ourselves. God, I need work. Because the minute you think that you, you are already there, that you are prepared, that means you stop working hard at it. And you're not prepared. Right? Some people, and you will see this at your work job, they, they just work just to get by. And then there's others that work hard. Like if they're going to get a promotion, right? And the harder you work, the more you will succeed in that promotion. But when you get comfortable, that's where you'll stay. It is the same concept in, in the Christian world. The harder we work to better ourselves, the higher you will go with God. But the minute you say, hey, I'm good, I made it, I made it to church, God saved me, I'm good. No, no, no. You're losing. You're losing. That's why there's a lot of foolish churches in America because 
we are losing. We're losing the battle because everybody is just so comfortable. Everybody gets comfortable. Don't get comfortable in your growth. Amen? So, 50-50. What does the lamp symbolize? See, back in those days, they didn't have electricity lamps that we have. I was telling you guys how I bought my wife some nice lamps, and those are electrical. You just plug them in. And she's like, well, th there's, no, there's no spot over here to plug it in. And I was like, it's okay. It's just for decoration anyways. <laughs> Honestly, because I don't see myself sitting right there by the lamp reading a book at night. Right? If I did, I'll just turn on the big light. <laughs> so in reality, a lot of our lamps, now some of you guys might actually use your lamps, but in reality, most of the houses that we go to, they just kind of sit there for decoration. <laughs> so, what are the lamps? What do they symbolize? The Word of God. The lamp is the Word of God. It shines upon your life. It gives you clarity, right? When you turn on the lights in here, it gives you clarity. If everything was closed, uh, all the lights were off, it would be dark. You couldn't see, right? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. See, before we were blinded in the things of the world. We were blinded by our sinful nature. We thought this is all there is to life. But when we met Jesus Christ, He turned on the light and we are able to see difference. Watch this. Now let me tell you, back in those days they didn't have the same lamps. Okay. It was very valuable that you carry oil with your lamp. They didn't have electricity, so they had to use fire. They wouldn't burn without the oil. It's kind of like a, a, a gasoline, right? You set it on fire, it lights up. So you either had a couple different types of lamps back then. You either had what they would call was a stick and a rag around it, and you dipped it in the oil, so it was more like a torch. Or you had some kind of little contraption that, that carried the oil and some kind of wick on it, and, and you would set that on fire. But you had to keep putting oil on it. That way it would keep inflamed all night. Now understand, this is very, very valuable back in those days because guess what? They didn't have electricity, right? They didn't have it. So, if you didn't have that, you couldn't see anything, right? You wouldn't be able to see. So what does the oil symbolize? It's the Holy Spirit. The lamp in your life is the Word of God. The oil that keeps that in your life flaming is the Holy Spirit. That keeps you wanting more in life is that Holy Spirit. That keeps you alive is that Holy Spirit. See, you got the Word of God. Now, how do you apply the Word of God? Through the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, we would not have this understanding. Right? Adam told me last weekend that uh, he was at a restaurant and he began to pray for some soldiers after he left here Sunday, Sunday morning. He began to pray with some soldiers at the restaurant, right? That was the Holy Spirit revolving in him, telling him, go pray for them. Amen. 
Now the word was already giving them the light. The light was shining saying, hey, pray. But the Holy Spirit within him was giving him the strength and the words to come out. See, we don't have to know. We don't have to be Bible scholars. Understand that. Jesus never told you, go be a Bible scholar. Go to the University of Jesus. <laughs> Only for a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Only. You see those commercials all the time in, in TV. They, they sell you all this nonsense. It's good to have knowledge, but understand that without Jesus, without His Holy Spirit, there is no knowledge. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit, hand in hand, amen, hand in hand, will shine through your path. Let me say this. You have your lamp. You light it on fire, right? You dip it first in the oil, then you set it on fire. And then you're walking, walking through your journey. And then it goes out. What do you do? You reapply. You put more oil on it, and then you light it up again. Then it leads you to your path, right? It lights it up in the middle of the night. Understand that's hand in hand, the Word of God, right? You're going through life. What do you do? You read the Word of God. Through what? You ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Okay, God, I'm going through these things this, this week and I just don't know how to deal with them. God says, grab my Word, open it up. Holy Spirit, teach me on what I need to do. And then you apply it. But understand, you have to apply it over and over and over and over again. Does that make sense? What does the jars that carry the oil represent? It's our hearts. Our hearts. So we must put the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Amen? We must carry the Holy Spirit within our hearts. We must open up our heart and pour in God's salvation, God's Word, God's blessings. Amen? It is our heart. You are the thing that represents Jesus Christ, it, it, it comes within your heart. This thing that makes you change. Your heart keeps on beating and without it, what? You die. It keeps your body alive. So you must carry the oil, which is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God within your hearts. Amen? Carry it wherever you go. Say, God, I open up myself to you, Lord God. Come in me. You see, when you come in, when you come in Sundays and you say like this, you open up yourself and say, God, I need you. Come in me, Lord. Right? Now, Midnight. Why midnight? Jesus was talking about this parable. Why midnight? Midnight represents the darkest place. It is at the darkest hour, at your darkest moment in life. Jesus Christ shows up. It is when you need it the most 
that time of trial and tribulation at the very darkest hour when you're calling out Jesus that he shows up that's why midnight because at midnight you can't see clearly at midnight you can't think clearly At near midnight when you're in your bed praying and you do not know what to do. Right? Some of you guys might be stressed out this week, today, this morning, last night. Now, but here's the difference. At the time, at midnight, will you be ready? See, at midnight we get tired. Some of you guys work at night, so maybe you get tired in the morning. But at midnight, we get tired, we grow weary. So you might be Asking God to do a miracle in your life. You might have been asking and praying and, and praying and praying and worshiping and worshiping and, and praying and praying and all of a sudden you're praying and you're praying and you started early in the morning and now it's midnight and, and you're getting tired and you're getting tired. You're getting weary. You're getting tired. You're getting weary. And you begin to fall asleep. So, at that moment, are you ready? You're not thinking clearly, you're not. You're, you're tired. Lord, I've been waiting for you. Lord, I've been waiting for you. God, I need a miracle. God, I need a breakthrough. God, I need this. I need... God, you know that I'm suffering right now. You know what I'm going through, Lord God. You know my pain, Lord God. And you begin to get tired and tired and weary. Jesus is saying, don't grow tired. Don't grow weary because when you least expect it, I am there. I'm coming back. I'm saving you. I'm going to rescue you. Trust in me. Believe me that I'm coming. You just be ready to receive what I'm about to give you. Yes. Do not be like the foolish ones that weren't ready. You want your miracle, you want your blessing, you want your breakthrough? Be ready. The Bible says be ready of all, at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. I will worship Him. In the time of need, in the time you grow weary, worship Him. Right. Expect Him. Right. He is on His time, not on our time. And we might think He's late, but He's right on time. God is never late. He's working things out that you cannot see because it's dark. He's working them out. Now, to the church, he's saying, he's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. All around the world, and what do you see? Disaster happening. You see people in churches preaching all kinds of crap. That's what it is. They just want to, whatever fits me or whatever, oh, what? Yeah, you, you have two wives? Okay. Yeah, we, we can make it work. Yeah, the, well, Moses had two wives, or, or wait, no, Abraham had two wives. Yeah, so yeah, you can have two wives. God never said to have two wives. Amen. He never said that. 
but he showed us everything to learn from their mistakes. It was a mistake. David had multiple wives. It was a mistake. I understand that. But yet, people nowadays, they want to say, well, no, it's okay for this. It's okay for you to do this. It's okay. Everything's okay. Nothing is a sin anymore. Why? Because the churches all around the world has, have gone weary. They've gone tired because for years they said, Jesus Christ is coming back, and they've gotten tired. So they're not ready. They're not ready. But He's coming back on His time. So the Bible says to be ready. Do not be like the foolish ones. Be like the wise one. Be ready. Have your word. Guard it with your heart. Guard the Holy Spirit. Amen. Protect our kids. Because guess what? All these rappers and singers and musicians out there, they're showing them a bunch of mess. And they all say, Oh yeah, I, I love God. I, they all stand at the award shows with the trophy. First of all, I like to thank God. And they were just booty bumping, their, shaking their butts all over their last video, half naked and selling sex. That is not God. Do not thank God. That, that might be your God, the devil, but not my God. God's like, I don't want no part of that. I'm not there, right? So we must be ready. Don't grow tired and weary in this life. I know sometimes we get tired. Oh, I don't want to go to church today. I'm so tired. No, no, be ready. Get to church because then we will give you what you need. God says, come here and replenish so next week you can be ready. It's that outlet. Nowadays, it is that outlet. Without that outlet, our electrical lamps don't work, right? Jesus Christ is that outlet. You're trying to lamp your world without that plugging in first. You have to plug in to Jesus Christ. Amen. Plug in. So, Jesus is saying, don't grow weary. I'm coming. And we call on Jesus and you're like, Jesus. And Jesus is like, I'm coming. Like Jesus, you see what I'm going through this week? Jesus is saying, I'm coming. You know this world, it's all going crazy. Jesus is saying, I'm coming. God, I need a miracle in my life. You see what I'm dealing with? Jesus is saying, I'm coming. I'm coming. I see you. I'm coming. Get ready. Be ready. Because I'm coming. You want your breakthrough? You want your miracle? God has it. Jesus has it. He sees it. What the most thing that you want and need in your life, that thing that you've been praying over and over and over, do not grow weary in doing so. Because Jesus Christ says, I am coming! Yeah. He's coming. Jesus is... He's coming. See, we must tell our neighbors he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Tell some people about Jesus Christ. Yes. You don't know what they're going through. Tell them Jesus is coming. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. We must wake them up. We must wake up our neighbors. We must wake up our neighborhood, our friends, our families, 
and let them know about the love of Christ. So they too can get ready when Jesus Christ comes back. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord.